All right. Well, <clears throat> I'm feeling like there's some strength coming. All right. All year, we're focusing on learning the way of Jesus. And today, we're continuing a four-part sermon series called DNA. And we're focusing on our identity of who we are, our core values that define us here at this church. Now, our core values are inviting people to worship, <clears throat> connecting people in community, training people for ministry, and sending people on mission. Now, today, we're talking about training people for ministry. If you missed the first couple uh, sermons in this series, you can always go back and watch or listen online. It'll sound better, I guarantee it. Um, but uh, today, we're talking about ministry. Now, at the most foundational level, worship, community, ministry, and mission form the basic building blocks of the Christian life. And when these values are guided and empowered by our mission and vision as a church, which are rooted in the truth of God's word, they become our DNA, encoding everything that we need for life and flourishing as a church. Well, today we're considering just an amazing truth that God has given each one of us, his people, a unique set of spiritual gifts, gifts of his grace, so that we might minister or serve one another, building up the body of Christ. So I hope that what we'll see today is that every Christian is a minister. The work of ministry is not just for pastors or church staff or elders in the church only. Every Christian is a minister. So, so many people wonder why I'm here. What is the purpose of my life? And my friends, our calling to ministry in learning the way of Jesus is a huge part of finding our God-given purpose in life. And this is why we value training people for ministry as a church, because we wanna help you discover and grow and accomplish the beautiful purpose that God has for your life. And maybe today you have been told your whole life that you have no purpose or that you will accomplish very little. My friends, that is not true in Jesus. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app, we allow those around here. Uh, please take them and open them to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting with verse 4. If you don't know where it is, you can always look it up in the table of contents. I was talking to someone this past week. They said they were embarrassed to do that. I said, why? I look up <laughs> books of the Bible sometimes. I'm like, where exactly is Jude again? I don't. So, okay, if I, I'm a pastor, you can look it up too. We're going to go through uh, almost a whole chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, very little voice. What could go wrong? Um, so, but we're going to break it into two different bite sized pieces, hopefully, okay? So, part one, we'll start with 1 Corinthians 12, starting with verse 4. I better take a drink of this tea. All right, verse 4. There are different kinds of gifts but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Didn't we just sing something about the same God? Now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given, given through the spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge <clears throat> by means of the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit. And he distributes them to each one. To each one. To each one just as he determines. Okay, let's pause here. So 1 Corinthians is a, an epistle, we say, or a letter from the Apostle Paul to the Christians in and around the Greek city of Corinth in the first century AD. Now we know from the book of Acts, kind of a, a book of history in the, in the New Testament, Acts 18, that Paul stayed in Corinth for several years, preaching the gospel, making disciples, being you know, a disciple of Jesus, and helping plant a church there. Eventually, the Lord called Paul away. He bounced on down the road and left uh, the church in the hands of other leaders. However, there were problems, as there often are in local churches, are there not? And so Paul wrote back to Corinth to help clear some things up. Well, here in chapter 12, 
and really through the end of chapter 14. So we're not going to go through chapter 12, 13, and 14, although I'd love to. It's kind of one thought. Uh, but Paul addresses some issues that the Corinthians had in understanding their spiritual gifts and what ministry was supposed to look like for the followers of Jesus. So first, what are spiritual gifts? What are the gifts that come by God the Holy Spirit? Well, spiritual gifts, as we see in this passage, are gifts that God gives or distributes by his grace. The word for gifts in this context is very similar to the word grace. They're gifts of God's grace to his people by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so second, the purpose of these gifts we see in this passage is for ministry. We see this in verse five when Paul writes, there are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. Now the word translated service here is most often translated as ministry in the Bible. To be a minister is to be one who serves. To serve for the common good, as Paul says down in verse seven, but also to serve in order to build one another up in faith, in knowledge, in unity, in love, ultimately. That's the whole purpose of 1 Corinthians 13, the most popular passage to preach at a wedding ceremony. It's all about love. What Paul says is that the actual context of that is love in serving one another within the church. In other words, spiritual gifts are given to produce spiritual fruit. Spiritual gifts are given to produce spiritual fruit. Well, what are these gifts that have been distributed to all of us, apparently? Well, in verses 8 through 11, Paul mentions a number of gifts. If you want to look back, you can see gifts of wisdom, gifts of knowledge, gifts of spiritual discernment, of dis discerning between different spirits, and bold faith. For the, every Christian has faith, but some people have the spiritual gift of faith. They have so much more faith than the rest of us. Okay, that's a gift. Well, who among us wouldn't want one of these gifts? I want to be more wise, don't you? I want to know more things in 2023, don't you? I want to have boldness in my faith, don't you? These are amazing. But then he goes on to list a number of Fant more fantastic sounding gifts like gifts of healing and miracles and prophecy and speaking in tongues and the interpretation of tongues now this is gonna, this, these things could be a sermon series in themselves and unfortunately we don't have time to today to unpack in detail everything there is to say about all of these gifts that he mentions here now of course we, we have a core value of training people in ministry and so we will have many opportunities as a church and as a body over time to learn more about these gifts. Hopefully, you'll have time and opportunities to practice these gifts and grow in these gifts and see the spiritual fruit that comes from spiritual gifts. But even with, <clears throat> even with the more fantastic sounding gifts, we must remember that these gifts that God gives his people are for ministry. They're to serve. If there is some need within the church, whether it is sort of a normal, humdrum, run-of-the-mill need, or whether it requires a miracle of God, we can count on God to give us what we need to do the work of ministry. Now, there are several lists of spiritual gifts in the New Testament, in the Bible, but a curious fact is that each list differs. None are the same. Now, this suggests to me and to many that that means none of these lists, lists are meant to be exhaustive of all the spiritual gifts, but simply examples. In Romans chapter 12, we read it earlier this morning, in addition to the gifts mentioned here, Paul mentions other gifts such as serving, teaching, encouraging. Some of you have the gift of encouragement, and it is like life itself. The gift of giving, of leading, of showing mercy. Spiritual gifts are also seen in the Old Testament in the Bible. They're seen throughout the Bible. For example, let's just look at one passage in Exodus chapter 36, verse 1. Okay, we got some Old Testament Bible names. You ready? So Bezalel and Oholiab 
and every skilled person to whom the Lord has given skill and ability to know how to carry out all the work of constructing the sanctuary are to do the work just as the Lord has commanded. Okay, think about what is being said here. These men, these artisans, are, are called to do the work that God has prepared in advance for them to do. He gave them the skill. He gave them the ability. He's calling them to do the work with the tools that he has given them. How cool is that? A spiritual gift of, like, what, carpentry? Of, of design? Of building? Of construction? Of masonry? I mean, this is really incredible stuff. We see, we see the gift of leadership in the Old Testament. We see the gift of, of administration. I think of someone like the Old Testament prophet of Daniel. Daniel was in exile in Babylon. The king of Babylon, who's basically the king of the world at that point, said, get me that brother Daniel. I need him on my team because he had the spiritual gift of leadership and administration. <laughs> no one was better than him because of the Lord's gifting. I think of gifts in the Old Testament such as knowledge and wisdom, of musical ability. One thing I, talk, I tell our worship team, our band members, a lot, First Chronicles chapter 15, it says that uh, Ken and I was, was appointed to be the leader of the singers because he was good at it. That's in the Bible, okay? Where did he get that skill? Where did he get that ability to be able to sing and lead others in song and singing worship? From the Lord, praise God, okay? There was gifts of prophecy and healing in the Old Testament. Elijah, Elisha, there's so many more examples of how the Lord has gifted his people. So far back as we have a record, <clears throat> we see God graciously giving his people spiritual gifts in order to do the work of ministry. And it wouldn't surprise me one bit if God continued to add spiritual gifts over time in different cultures and times and places as, as, as there are needs within the body. Wouldn't surprise me at all if we find out there's a spiritual gift of IT work or web design or graphic design or, or mobile phone app design or whatever. Wherever the needs are, the Lord will provide to do the work of the ministry. But a key insight here, okay, a key takeaway for me is that the spiritual gifts are never ends in and of themselves. They are never the point. They're always a means to another end. They are, the point isn't really to focus on the gifts that God has given us, as amazing as it is to find out that the Lord of the universe has gifted you in certain ways. The point is, and the point is certainly not to think that our spiritual gifts make us better than other people. The gifts were always meant to serve the needs of others. Ministry means to serve. Spiritual gifts are meant to produce spiritual fruit. Not personal attention, not increasing our status, not growing our material gain. These are not the point of the gifts that God has given us. He's given these things for us to be able to serve others so that we might build up the body together in love and good deeds. Spiritual gifts are given to produce spiritual fruit. Well, let's continue with the second half of, of our reading today in chapter 12. Paul gives us a metaphor, incredible metaphor, on how we, with all our various gifts, are somehow supposed to do ministry as one. Let's continue with verse 12. One more drink of tea. Cheers. Just as a body, just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. <clears throat> now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand... I do not belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, well, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not be, for that reason, uh, part, uh, stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body Every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, 
but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those <clears throat> parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lack it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. This is God's word. Now the metaphor of the church being the body of Christ and that Christians are like various parts or members of this body is very helpful. We learn so many things from this metaphor, but I'm just gonna give you three today. First, we learn from this picture of the church that even though we are different as individuals, we are still only one body. We are united. We are one. As I said last week, unity does not mean uniformity. Not only are we united despite the differences that we have across our cultures or languages or ethnicities or classes or genders, but we're united despite our differences in our spiritual gifts, in our experiences, in our, in our passions, in our knowledge for various kinds of ministry. So the church, our church, should always reflect unity among diversity. And that must include physical diversity, cultural diversity, and spiritual diversity. There is more that unites us in Christ than divides us, but it's more than that. It seems that God loves diversity. Just look at the rest of creation. If you were making a world, how would you do it? Would you make more than one kind of bird or more than one kind of flower? Or would you, like, like me, like pick your favorite, figure out which one you would like the most and just go with that one? That's what birds look like. That's my favorite one. But look at the world that God has made. It's estimated that there are 10,000 different species of birds 10,000. Uh, there are over 400,000 different varieties of flowering plants. 400,000. Don't get me started on bugs. There are way too many <laughs> bugs. But I think all of this diversity points to the fact that God must want it this way. He must love that. If he loves the diversity in the world... It should be no surprise that he would want diversity to be found within the church as well. Though we are many, and though we are different in many ways, we are one in Jesus. Second, we learn from this picture, this metaphor of the body of Christ, that all the various spiritual gifts given to other Christians are not optional for us. They are vital for our life <clears throat> and growth and flourishing. A hand or an ear or an eye would be basically useless and quickly lifeless apart from a physical body. It's only within the body that the unique gifts and abilities of each part are able to fully function in the way that they were created. And this is partly because they were created not to be independent, a hand was not created to be a hand on its own, but in interdependent. <laughs> My hands are getting away from me. Excuse me. Sorry, sorry, Ted. I'm encroaching on your space. Um, so it is with Christians. Listen, when I was standing down here and I was trying to sing, normally I can sing pretty good. I was trying to make a joyful noise this morning and it was not going well. And at some point, <clears throat> I gave up. Not in worship, but in trying to sing, and I just sat and I listened, and you sang for me. 
That's what it means to be a part of the body of Christ. We need one another. Why do Christians need the church? Because we were not made to be independent either. Now listen, I love the freedom and liberty of our culture in this country, but we were never meant to be an island on our own. We were created to be interdependent. We desperately need one another. <laughs> Even though we're all a little weird, we need each other because the church is the Christians in the church. Christians are the church and we need one another. Not one of us can look at someone else and say, I don't really need you. I don't really need you. So you might wonder, uh, can a Christian be a Christian and not be a member of, the local of a local church? Like go through the membership process and like vote on the 29th, you know, things like that. Well, the answer is yes. Our status before God does not rely on our official membership within a local church or church attendance or really anything other than faith alone in the person and work of Christ alone. However, I have never in my years as a pastor ever met a healthy, mature disciple of Jesus who was not regularly part of a local church, not one. I've met plenty of unhealthy and immature Christians struggling to do life out there on their own, but this is not good. It might make sense because they experienced hurt in a particular local church and they're going through a process of healing and they're trying to figure out where the Lord is calling them next. I understand that, but they're vulnerable. When we are alone, we are vulnerable to all manner of sin and struggle in life. And very often, when we are vulnerable and when we are alone and when we remain apart from the body, we walk away or seem to fall away from the faith that we profess. May it not be for us. Now this does not, this <clears throat> does this mean that if a Christian is committed to a local church, that nothing bad will ever happen to you? <laughs> I sadly cannot say that that is true. Unfortunately, the answer is no. We, we saw last week that while we are still living in this age and in this broken world, very often we will have to deal with sin. Friends, if you spend more than about five minutes with somebody, you're gonna have to start thinking about how to deal with sin. Sometimes, tragically, that includes sin within the church. Now, if that sin is found in the church on a personal level, we must deal with that through the clear process that Jesus outlines, humble repentance, forgiveness, and seeking reconciliation if it is possible. If it's more of a systemic problem, it's more of a systems problem in a particular church or denomination, then what we need to do is work for reform. Now the Protestant Reformation about 500 years ago is a great example of this work. It seems like many reformations are needed about every generation, but sadly sometimes <clears throat> reform isn't possible. At this point, we must move on to a different local church or denomination, but we must never, ever reject the local church altogether because the church is the only body of Christ. No other institution or parachurch organization will replace it. It is the only thing that God has promised to build which will last forever and against which even the gates of hell will not stand. Well, thirdly, this lesson uh, from the body of Christ is that some ministry roles and gifts are more visible than others. We get that from the metaphor of the body. You know, face, hands, we tend to see these a lot. Uh, other parts of our body, not as much, right? But this does not mean that the gifts that are more visible are more important. Now, my role as a pastor and a preacher or the ministry of our worship team, leading musical worship, prayer, scripture readings. Uh, both of these roles are, are much more visible uh, than on a weekly basis than some of the other ministry work that is done faithfully in our church. But I am not more important than you. You can say amen. amen. Thank you. <laughs> Just, thank you. 
I'm not more important than you. Our worship team is not more important than your ministry team. Uh, in fact, Paul is pretty clear. For the more visible ministers among us, we need no special honor. It's the ones, it's the people who minister behind the scenes. Maybe not on Sunday morning, maybe throughout the week. Maybe in someone's home. Maybe in visiting the sick. Maybe in just silently praying at home for their brother or sister. These ministries need special honor. So we must be very careful that we honor and appreciate and value as a church the ministry work that is done out of sight by everyone here. As Paul says, God has put the body together. Do you believe that? God has put us together. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. It's not my role. It's not your job, even if you want it. God has put this body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it so that there should be no division in the body and that its parts should have equal concern for each other. There is so much the Lord is doing outside of Sunday morning in this church and not up on stage for all of you to see. Our worship service this time is wonderful. I love it. I hope it's powerful, and I hope that we continue to grow and make it as good as we can make it on this side of heaven. But this time is only a tiny fraction of the total bandwidth of our ministry capacity as a church. Now, you might be wondering how you can discover and grow in your spiritual gifts. And for those of you who are new to the Christian faith, or maybe you're just considering what it looks like to follow the way of Jesus, this is a big part and you may have no idea uh, how God might have gifted you to serve and minister to others. Well, we have various ministry teams which serve various roles and needs within the body of our church. We have a worship team. We have a hospitality team, a kids team, um, which is awesome. Uh, we have a student ministries team uh, who is doing the work of ministry right now in Green Bay coming back from the district youth conference with very little sleep and probably about the same voice I have <laughs> with hearts full of what God has done there. Oh boy, the tea's making me emotional <laughs> or the lack of sleep. We have a facilities team. We have a care team. We have so, we have so many different ministry opportunities for you here. Now over the years, as our church has grown and become more complex, our ministry teams have grown and become a little more complex as well. We've added different roles to meet the growing complexity of the needs found within this body of people. We have a care, our care team currently is the one that is being developed, and we'll be talking more about that in the coming months. So if you aren't a part of a ministry team, this is just a big invitation. Um, we're not looking for people with a pulse to just plug into some slot. We are looking for you to serve in the ways that God has gifted you to serve because we need you. I need you. And you need us. That's how the body works. Now, if you aren't sure how God has gifted you, my best advice is just to try some stuff and see what happens. If you try speaking or if you try playing piano and you can't sing and you can't play, like, that's probably not the best fit, you know? If you consider working with kids and you don't like kids, don't do that, okay? <laughs> but if you're like, I love kids, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind trying, and you get plugged in and you start serving and you realize, oh my goodness, the Lord has made me for this, there's no higher purpose. There's no greater joy. So it's a process of learning. It's a process of trying, taking some risks. You people who have been gifted with that boldness of faith, it's easier for you, okay? <laughs> Help us. Help us grow in our faith to be able to step out and take risks. For those of you who are gifted in mercy and healing, and you were passionate about prayer, help us. 
Help us grow in our passion for that. Would you help us? For those of you who are just on fire for worshiping the Lord, would you help us? Would you give us some of your passion? Would you share a song for us when we can't sing? Another way, <clears throat> another way that you can know how you've been gifted by God is if you're passionate about something or if you're irritated about something, okay? I have, can't tell you the number of times over the years where someone has come up to me and said, did you know this is happening over there? I said, I do, but I don't care about that. Do you care about that? Maybe you should go do something about that. <laughs> and they're like, oh, well, I kind of just wanted to tell you about it. That's not how this works, okay? If you're irritated about something, if something just kind of makes you cringe, you, maybe you should be a part of that. Uh, but most often, when you're passionate about something and you just can't not do it, friends, the reason I'm preaching to you today with very little voice left is I can't not do it. Like Jeremiah I try to stop, and it doesn't work. The word of God is a fire within me. So we need your fire too. That's how this works. Well, <clears throat> we're almost home. So beyond our ministry teams, friends, every Christian has the ability, and as your pastor, I give you permission, all right? I'm deputizing you right now to serve in love, the needs of anybody at any time. You don't have to wait for my permission. You don't have to necessarily be a part of a formal ministry team. Just do it. Okay? You have the spirit of the living God. He has given you gifts. Use them. We need them. If he's moving you today, follow that prompt. If he's just got... If you're uncomfortable, if you're starting to sweat a little bit because you feel like God is pushing you out of your comfort zone, go. He'll go with you. You know what? We'll come with you too. So whether it's in a more formal capacity or informally, but still led by the Spirit, every Christian is a minister who has been given gifts of God's grace, spiritual gifts which produce spiritual fruit. No one is left out. Everybody gets to play. And in carrying on this gospel ministry, we find our great and glorious purpose in life. As a church, we will continue to train people for ministry because this is the work of discipleship. This is our DNA. This is who we are. But at the end of the day, <clears throat> it is joyful worship that is the only right response to the gracious gifts of the living God. We deserve nothing. He gives us all. We have earned nothing, and yet he paid it all. We ought to have offered him, our creator, our lives, but he gave us his in Jesus and he continues giving by pouring out his spirit and pouring out his love and pouring out gift upon gift of his grace, filling and empowering us with the highest purpose. You won't find this anywhere else. To join God in his work of redemption and new creation so that we might love and serve our brother so that we might minister to our sister and help break the bonds of sin and death and free them to enjoy the love and spiritual growth and unity in the body of Christ. For all of this, the loudest, the sweetest song of thanksgiving could never do justice to the glory, honor, and praise that our gracious Lord deserves. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, you have said 
that you care for us. And you have said that in your care and your love that you were willing to save us. And in our salvation, you have said that you have given us gifts of grace so that we might minister to others and help them grow in this same love and in this same purpose and in the unity of your body that your son Jesus has accomplished for us and you have empowered by your Holy Spirit and we are blessed by you. We thank you, we praise you and Lord we ask for your help to empower us to use these gifts in powerful ways not to increase our status or to gain material wealth for ourselves, but for your glory and for the good of all people and, Lord, for our joy. We love you and we pray all these things in Jesus' name and thank you for the voice. Amen.